What is up, everybody? It's Mark from 403 Fauna, along with Jason Radass Designs. Welcome to the Fauna Topic, where each week we cover relevant news in the ball python and reptile industry. Mm -hmm. Oops, let me go back. Sorry. <laughs> it's like if we're newscasters that's like the you know weather coming on you know first when it's supposed to be later but you know that happens <laughs> so there's gonna be three major topics we cover today um and the title for this is our ball python breeders dodos and the dodo bird if you're not familiar with the dodo bird it's a bird that was on an island where a lot of hungry sailors would go to. And since they had no natural predators, they would just walk up right up to the sailors. Sailors would club on the head and have a big old turkey dinner. And mm. they called them dodos because they thought they were dumb. But in reality, they just didn't have any natural predators and didn't see the sailors as a threat. So they're extinct now. And our ball python <laughs> readers going to be extinct to uh, reptile shows soon. We'll talk about that today. So how was your week, Jason? Um, my week was extra challenging because life will throw you curveball sometimes, whether you play baseball or not. But um, I, I'm just rolling with it. I essentially was uh, not really immersed in the hobby per usual in the last week. And that's fine. I kind of took like a little personal break. Um, and uh, I'm here with you now. I've checked out a couple of things today. I'm just going to go on the fly, make the most of it, and uh, uh, didn't give a ton of extra attention to the reptiles this week, honestly. It was like a maintaining, like almost like a skip week. As bad as that might sound, sometimes snakes can handle that as long as they have clean water. So, you know, that's it's all right. Um, here I am. Yeah, no, nothing major to... Uh, announce in in that area i mean i had had a girl ovulate recently and then a second one seems to be so that's pretty cool i'm watching that but it's gonna take you know I, there's a little bit more time before that turns into something but pretty cool for me to see an obvious ovulation and it looks like a second one but other than that kind of just chill yeah Congratulations on those obbies. I'm still yeah. behind on that. I started breeding this year in January. I figured I would try that just to see if I could spare some of my young males from going off food and and not doing their job. So far, it seems to be working. I mean, maybe my girls will go a little bit later this year, but mm -hmm. things are looking really good on the breeding front. I know we're scheduled for rain here in San Diego on Saturday. So yeah. My schedule is perfect for putting some snakes together. I've got some girls and some guys that will be paired for the first time. So I'm looking forward to that. And they've been eating well. One thing I'm, I'm a little disappointed in is my banana 50% het monsoon girl. After yeah. I paired her up and she got that lock in, she's kind of slowed down on the eating. So mm -hmm. that's kind of just her way of telling me, hey, it's not going to be my year this year. So I'm going to maybe give her one more opportunity with a lock and then right. if i don't see her turn on that eating then i'm just going to shut her down for the year but it should still be a very exciting year for me over here and should produce a lot of cool double heads some visuals and i'm really excited for things yeah i mean it's it's interesting how that can happen sometimes they're all in their own schedules we've talked about that i mean ball pythons are quirky <laughs> i'm quirky i can relate and um you know i i had a a snake that's one of my favorite snakes that um also has banana in it and um hey john uh, and and i had paired her and paired her and she is my best eater by far that i've ever had ever pretty much in snakes and in, in the history of being involved with reptiles Oh man, I love that snake so much. And when I, after pairing her, I, I would feed her a little bit, and um, I, I moved her to a freedom breeder rack, um, and she seemed happy in there, and she would continue eating. And I tried pairing her a little bit more, but it, I think 
maybe one more time, but like, I basically wanted her to get in her like, you know, kind of maternity zone and, and have more space. And she seemed to like that as much as her other cage that she was raised in. And um, she wouldn't do a whole lot more eating. And then I'm like, okay, here we go. This is awesome. This is like one of my most important projects. And she won't, she won't really eat Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and like she's on Weight Watchers or something and she's developing and she's doing different things. And one day I saw an, an ovulation and I, I believe and I, I posted it on uh, Instagram and I'm like so excited and it just it's dragging out. Nothing is really seeming to change. I mean, maybe if I had a, you know, an, an ultrasound, I would better know. It does clearly seem like she's getting fatter and gaining weight while not eating. But man, is it taking forever. <laughs> but a lot of people like you said are, are kind of in this boat of having like a later season a lot of people are reporting that but a lot of those people are also starting to say that things are starting to uh, build some action so we'll we'll see it's a class of patients being a ball python breeder especially those at ovulation pre-ovulation shed post-ovulation shed and they're all 30 days in between oh. and then the two month incubation. So yeah, I just got to have a lot of patience with this. Yeah. So last week, our winner for the question of the week was Jessica from Hair Hollow Farm. I haven't seen her in the chat yet, but mm -hmm. so congratulations to Jessica. Super awesome person. We're all yeah. familiar with her. I'm sure the chat's familiar with her. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on her before we moved into the question of the week? Well, we we kind of touched on her and other like influencers and you know um, people that have done great things and and getting attention um, and contributing to the reptile hobby, especially in the ball python area of it. And you know, so we've already said a million good things about <laughs> Jessica Hare, and she's she I I couldn't have a better opinion hardly of anyone in the hobby so pretty cool that um we're inspired by what she's been doing and um that we're doing our thing and that she's here showing some support time to time it, it uh means the world yeah and she got that right because she knows a lot <laughs> yeah it's getting tougher to come up with some some questions <laughs> but as if you don't know if you guess on the problem of the week correctly You'll get the shout out of the week for next week, but you'll also be eligible for a drawing at the end of the year for a snake produced by me. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's putting the pressure on me because I got I better produce some good snakes. We've got <laughs> here, Charlie from Grey Rider. We've got Jason, all previous winners and many more. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely have to come up with a snake that anyone would want. So I'm thinking maybe a het monsoon, maybe a a stacked double recessive female or a clown who knows but hopefully yeah, i'll have and 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 mark i'll go ahead and throw 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 my hat in there like i will put in a snake too i mean this is your idea and your thing and uh but we're doing this together and awesome. um i'll we'll talk about it later as the year goes on we have lots of time <laughs> we're gonna make some cool stuff i'm sure but like uh if you, we do maybe a runner-up or maybe somebody gets two snakes. We'll we'll figure that out. But I'll uh, I'll add something to it as well. That sounds great. I mean, Het Monarch. No, I'm just kidding. It's it's. So yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll see. We'll see. I mean, we don't have to like mention it as like a thing. But we'll <laughs> later on we'll go back to it and we'll hey you know you can have this too. Okay, so the the problem of the week is coming up next. Once I put it up, start putting your guesses in the chat. First correct answer I see in the chat will be the winner and we'll get a shout out for next week and be eligible for a drawing for a free snake. So without further ado, here is our problem of the week. Okay, besides ball pythons, this species has the most numbers on morph market. A, crested geckos, B, leopard geckos, C, hognose snakes, or D, corn snakes. Hmm. hmm. Jason, um, have you kept any of these species here? Yeah, I've, I've had uh, all of those species. Um, well, actually, except hognose snakes. But way back in the day, they were super cheap. <laughs> they're popular now in their, their own wave and craze. But um, 
you used to be able to go to a show um, in the early 2000s and, and see a hognose snake baby for, you know, they don't have all the cool line bread, you know, stuff that they have now, but they, uh, they were captive bread and you can get them for like 25 to like 40 bucks, like no big deal. And um, um, they had some color stuff going on. But yeah, no, I, I think I always like was drawn towards the tricolor hog noses in that I like tricolor king snakes and mount, mountain king snakes. Um, and so I've always been keeping my eye on those. Um, they're actually pretty affordable compared to all the other stuff that's going on with the jeans and, and whatnot. And they're a slightly different acting hog nose, but um I think they're really cool looking. Um, but yeah, I've had plenty of all the others. I've had some crested geckos from the first batches in the, the late 90s. And I had one that I I traded away stupidly because it was pretty hard to get female crested geckos. In the early years of them coming out, people did not want to give those up. And it seemed like at the time there would just be tons of males where it's sort of the reverse with their cousin gargoyle gecko. But um, I had this one that was like chocolatey. It kind of essentially looked like a, like a, 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 a cappuccino or whatever they call them now. I mean, I'm not like immersed all in, all up in crested geckos right now, but they have a whole bunch of line bread things, and and it was like super soft. So I don't know if that was a soft scale or what, but man, was it a beautiful female that I got really affordably from my friend who owned a pet store and he hooked me up with it. And, and for some reason I traded it away for something else I, I felt I had to have. And, you know, now, now you see crested geckos like that. They're, they're pretty expensive. Uh, and corn snakes, I've only had uh, uh, two corn snakes. I traded one to a punk rock friend way back in the day. And uh, I just, it just landed in my possession. And uh, for a short while, I don't know why I didn't keep it longer, but I had a snow corn snake that developed some yellow. They don't stay all white. And, and it, was, it was a good eater, similar to like a king snake in a way. But corn snakes are essentially in the rat snake family. And for whatever reason, rat snakes are just like not really my vibe. Some of them are really cool, really hardy. There's so much variability in species and subspecies. And I just, um, I'm not a rat snake person really so, so much. But um, yeah, and of course, I love leopard geckos. So yeah. I remember um, I went to a reptile show mid 2000s and I was walking by and some a crested gecko breeder was talking to another person. And I remember he mentioned that he had made four thousand dollars in sales, and my mind was just four thousand dollars for crested geckos. Oh my gosh, we need to get into those. But mm -hmm. you know, um, crested geckos is the correct answer, and we saw that Quest the Rebel Gaming was the first to answer that correctly. There's five thousand eight hundred thirty currently on Morph Market. Compare mm -hmm. that with ball pythons. There are forty thousand ball pythons in the U.S. and Canada. This is actually an order here, so. Crested geckos, second, leopard geckos, hognose, and then corn snakes. There might be other stuff listed in there, but those were like some of the more common species that I figured would have some big numbers on morph market. Sure. And they're like, it makes sense because they're pretty much like the leading species uh, available and entry level pets that are, you know, marketed and, and typically acquired. So, yeah. <laughs> So congratulations, Quest the Rebel Gaming. You will get a shout out next week and will be eligible for a drawing at the end of the year. So Beast Morphs, I think a lot of us who keep have kept other species at some point and some continue to keep multiple species, we'll tie this into one of our topics that we're going to get to down the road. But congratulations again, Quest the Rebel Gaming. Now let's get it to our rat ass snake of the week. Oh, yeah. I can see it from here. Lauren, you want to bring him to me, if you would? All right, one sec. What do you think? Do you like him? Oh, just adorable. You're right. 
All right. My cousin says the snake is adorable, and so thus it is. <clears throat> All right. So this. All right, audience, let's try to guess the genes here before Jason tells us what it is. But tell us how you got it and who's it's from. A uh, little bit of a giveaway then. But uh, yeah, I got this from the recent commenter there in this episode, Beast Morphs. I believe he's in like the Michigan area. Super awesome dude. One of my favorite people in the hobby and works with uh, this gene and has done some cool stuff with it. Some out of the box stuff. And he just looked pretty good today. I was going to grab a different snake, but I, um, yeah, I, I kind of had kind of planned to, but I grabbed him instead. I wanted to check on him. He ate, um, about a week ago, a small mouse. And, um, he's been doing really good. He's got like a little cave that he is apparently small enough to get in and really enjoy and he loves this freaking cave that's in his tub <laughs> mm. and uh he's got a little skull decoration you know like like one of those little like crow skulls or whatever um and uh he's doing he's doing good I named I'm him not... Snow Snowflake, so his name is Snowflake. <laughs> so I'm not going to guess because I believe I had this saved on my Morph Market before you picked it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do have guests of Cypress and Fire. Do you want to tell us what it is? Yeah, I mean, Fire would almost like make a little bit of a, sen a sense in like how bright he is, but he is a desert ghost specter. So in the yellow mm -hmm. belly complex, black pastel. Is there like a 50% hit cryptic attached to that or? or no? There is. And, and some people believe that there's like essentially head markers and head stamp patterns for like guessing cryptic where you can like see certain things that are typical with known head cryptic animals. Some people can just like straight up identify it. Um, those have thick eye bands. Yeah. Um, the snake that I was gonna show today is 66% het cryptic, but I've had very knowledgeable, experienced people with the cryptic gene just look at her and just be like, oh yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's het for that other one. Obviously there's no way to tell, but that, um, pretty like you could take it to the bank. And so this guy's 50% het cryptic. Now his brother, uh, Aaron kept, cause it was the same snake plus mystic. And, um, it was also 50% het cryptic and he sent a shed test out. I assumed a Charlie and, uh, it did. Yeah. See there he's saying right there, it, it didn't prove out. So I was like, oh man, I wanted that, uh, I, you know, to work out for him. But I haven't tested this guy yet, and so there's still still hope there. <laughs> and um, maybe eventually I can send a baby back to Aaron that's got cryptic in it from him, if he proves. But yeah, like uh, people love Desert Ghost, and 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 I can see why. Mark, like you've seen some at shows, and you you've got some Desert Ghost, but like this was my first one. And I was like, when you see a desert ghost in person and you haven't really seen too many in person and you, you have a snake collection that's growing and, and then you add this to it, man, I, I get the allure. Like they're beautiful, especially in certain combos like pastel and yellow belly and different, different things. Um, some things it doesn't wow you as much. You think it would do something more dramatic, but with black pastel and with specter this guy glows in the dark he's like you know i don't have like a radiometer like thingy where i can like check to see if he's nuclear but he definitely looks that way <laughs> but that's the snake of the week yeah thank you for sharing that desert ghost yeah, is sure. one of my favorite jeans 
and I produced two last year and I'm still stunned. I, every time I open up their tubs, it's just like, wow, I made yeah. that. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, Mark. And you're going to make more of them for sure. Cause I just have him and I have a, a het female coming from Steve's morphs. And he basically raised a yellow belly and she double like our uh het desert ghost um and she yellow belly and i it, like she's basically ready to breed just about and um i mean you never know for sure but when you put specter which is the only example of specter i have in my collection and i don't have very much yellow belly and you cross those and you have desert ghosts on both sides somewhere in the genetics like you can make a super stripe desert ghost and that was that was uh what and you know what my plan was i'm inspired by aaron at beast marks because he's made some cool stuff in that area and i'm kind of copying him a little bit because i think that that's a really neat uh combination and that's what i'm going for as well definitely i i have saved from fireball reptiles uh, mm -hmm. desert ghost super stripe and i believe het cryptic also it, it looks incredible Speaking yeah, of, he's got a bunch of cool stuff here. Let me interrupt you again. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> but like the guy, oh man, what is his name from Fireball? Jeremy. Jeremy, that's right. Jeremy showed up at a show last summer. I believe it was Anaheim. And um, I, I'd never met him in person. I watch his videos, like not all of them, like religiously, but. Um, I watch his videos and I think, you know, he, he's an interesting character. The music that starts on YouTube is like, I like always mock it every time it comes on. Sorry, Jeremy, but I do. And he is like interesting in person, you know, like we all have our own little quirkinesses. I mean, I'm super quirky and I feel like he is a, a bit too in his own way. And he's man, he's got some big investments. And he has made some really cool snakes and he's just going full bore. I talked to him about that, of what it's like to go from working a job and being, you know, responsible adult and making money for your family and then transitioning into being an all-time breeder. Like, I don't so much recommend that people do that. And there's lots of people that are old timers that would say that that's not really the best route to go. You should always, you know, put that paycheck in your pocket, but you know do this on the side and just put in the extra energy and, and you know what i mean but he did that transition and he's doing it and um explained some of the challenges and stresses involved with that like putting a whole bunch of money from the money that you've made from snakes into the monsoon project when it's like at its height um and i, th I don't think he produced a whole lot from his first pairing with that and uh but he he is fun to chat with so anyone interested in, in, in Fireball Morphs, uh, go check him out on YouTube. Um, interesting character. He's got his son involved uh, in the business with him. I talked to him as well. And uh, lots of good stuff coming from him in the future for sure. Okay. I just want to clarify something here because there's so many Jeremy's and there's two different Fireballs. I believe you're talking oh. about Fireball Pythons. Fireball and Pythons? Am I? Yeah, because Fireball Reptiles, I don't think he has a YouTube. He's closely associated with the Bells. And oh, just me. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> no worries. It's it's confusing. I thought yeah. at least you're talking about Jeremy Bod of Bod's Exotics, but Oh yeah, Jeremy Bod. He's he's but, awesome. He's got yeah, some cool stuff. Jeremy, too. I think Smith from Fireball Reptiles. Mm -hmm. And there's Fireball Pythons. And there's like three different Jeremy's. <laughs> My bad. And and it's ironic because the gene that we'll be talking about in this episode couldn't be any more complicated and confusing. <laughs> okay, let's let's move on here. So page one of Morph Market, the auctions. Let's take a look. And I noticed that our buddy here, Aaron, mm -hmm. he just sold an auction right here. Mm -hmm. Right here. Aaron in the chat here, did you are you happy with your auction? Did you get what you wanted out of that? That's a extended. That's a pretty yellow belly, 
yellow belly uh, pied there. Like it's got a nice distribution of pattern. So while he's typing up that, I do want to share that I performed my first auction and it just sold. Nice. So I'm super happy with that. And ooh, I, I think I've got a message here I should answer. But <laughs> I had this email double hit hypo desert ghost, 66% mm -hmm. possible hit genetic stripe. I put her up for $250 and $50 shipping. I think mm -hmm. when all of us put something on Morph Market, we have our the price that we put, and then there's another price that we would accept. And when I was putting this up on auction, I was worried because after 24 hours, I think someone put a $5 bid. And, you know, shipping out of California, it's it's minimum $100 just to get it out of California. And Typically. I put uh, $75 shipping. And I'm hoping at least to cover that shipping and make a little mm -hmm. on top of that. But it did end up going for $125 and shipping, which I put at $75. So $200 shipped, mm -hmm. which I'm happy with that. That was kind of my my low point if someone would offer that, that I would have mm -hmm. accepted it. This particular snake did not get much activity on Morph Market when I put it up. It's I think it got like 400 views or something. But yeah. I'm, I'm happy with my first auction. I know you've had a couple of auctions. How has your experience been with that so far? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I feel, and I've mentioned this before in the show, like there's definitely um, an ideal, like there's a, there's a strategy, I feel, to putting snakes on at certain key times, certain key times in the, the flow of the hobby in the market, just like selling stocks at a certain, you know, certain time on, you know, the, the NASDAQ. Like I saw that you put this snake and I was curious what was going to happen with it. So a cute little one and um definitely gonna do cool things for somebody someday and um you know for a double head snake i think she's i think she's really pretty but um yeah it's uh it can be hit and miss but there is definitely um a smarter way to go about putting postings of ball pythons on the auction and uh, uh you did okay you didn't totally lose out i feel someone got a really good deal um but that that works out i mean like like they say you can't keep everything and sometimes people deserve deals so someone got a good one there and you know i don't know the snake's disposition of how friendly she is but um pretty pretty cool opportunity for for someone i'm sure she'll be a, a great snake the notification for the message came right before we went on air and yeah. I read it on my phone a little bit, and I think I read that he was asking if I had any more double recessives, and actually I, I do. So this might lead to another snake I put in the box, which would be yeah. really cool if that happens. Yeah, and like we've heard people talk about that, about how um, you put stuff in the auctions, and, and everyone has their own takes on on the pros and cons of that. And we've seen it for a couple months now and, and how it's gone. And it's, I think it's been an influx of activity on the site and in the hobby. And I think it's been uh, continuing to prove out to be good for the hobby. But it definitely draws attention to, uh, to, to your collection, to your brand, and to what you have to offer and can lead to other sales that could be mutually beneficial. And um, hopefully that works out for you in that area as well. So yeah, I was I was happy with that and it potentially can lead to another sale. Okay, let's get to our hot topics of the week. We've got three big topics topics we'll be talking about. Mm -hmm. And let's just get right into it. The first one, I hope no one gets offended at this slide that I'm going to put up next, but mm -hmm. it's got to be brought up and it is Darian Jolinger versus Bob Clark. Uh-oh, hide your children, hide your wives. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, I know boy. one of my students is on here. Chip Zunes, close your eyes right now, okay? <laughs> okay, so, so. <laughs> this past week. Yeah, um, we're doing this, everybody. We're doing this. <laughs> Darian came back from, and I, I misspelled his name here. It should just be one hour. I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. But he came back from his vacation. Mm -hmm. And we, we all need those sometimes. Do you want to reveal that? you were working on something with Darian or not? Yeah, sure. Like I've been in talks with, with Darian ever since I got a uh, morph market tattoo. 
in order to get a free pro account upgrade and uh and my my beautiful better half she did that and um uh, some people would say uh yeah you're you're dumb for doing that well i got lots of tattoos and i'm not worried about it and i wanted to improve my account on morph market and uh i d i didn't really push for hey uh that promotion came up i i uh <laughs> i haven't received my pro account upgrade yet and i think like three or three and a half months went by and i didn't bug him and i'm like what is he like is he <laughs> is he punking me like what and i contacted him again about it and he's like um yeah i'm sorry about that man i'm super busy and you know uh we lost certain uh contacts on cert certain things that you you slip through the cracks i'm really sorry just just go contact the uh, the uh, the staff right now and we'll get that straight and uh and he did and it's cool but um yeah i've had some conversations with darian just about his uh you know his involvement in the hobby and his involvement on social media and um he he's actually in my opinion pretty reasonable and with it, as much attention as you can get when you're a personality like him in the position that he's in, like he, he will get back to most people in messages. Like he is interactable. He is reasonable. I'm a funny guy, I feel. And I have a good sense of humor. And, and I like to interact with people that uh, have a good sense of humor. And that's part of life and enjoying it. And, uh, you know, he, he has uh, an extreme personality. And, he, and he's somewhat opinionated, but uh, he he gets a he creates a a, a lot of a lot of uh, <laughs> he creates a bit of controversy and brings some stuff on himself. But he also entertains a lot, and uh, that that usually does pretty well for people that are on social media. And you know, I like personality. I don't want my president president of the country to be like. Uh, like a zombie and boring and dull like i'd rather it was somebody charismatic and funny and took chances like um i think his route uh ruffles a lot of feathers and uh he's uh you know not everyone's gonna like you we talk about that all the time mark not everyone likes you not everyone likes me not everyone likes the person next door and that's okay that's 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 america that's freedom and and that's fine um but he has definitely got um some people that are not big fans and uh that's sort of what this is uh resurfacing as is a um an issue of people not getting along <laughs> and darian went uh right after like a couple of days after last having an issue <laughs> with somebody whether it was all his fault or not doesn't matter like uh a big online uh social media personality and then they both went on vacation ironically it's just a coincidence and um i had talked to darian about coming on the show to address some of those kinds of things and and how you should responsibly like care for for animals and and some of like the important topics that you know you can easily educate people on and um and he's interested. He's very interested in coming on. He wouldn't commit to a date. He was getting ready to go on vacation. He told me that. And he, he shared some some really nice vacation photos. Check that out. You know, he's having a good time, you know, and it looks like he got some tattoos in Mexico, too, because you can see in the one photo, <laughs> he's got no tattoos. I got plenty. He He decided to copy me and start adding ink to his body. And uh yeah you, you clearly he's having a, a good time now i don't recommend getting super wasted and getting tattoos in mexico that's not the most responsible way to go about adding artwork but um he he needed to go unwind mark and and that's what he did and uh you know yeah and then here he is back <laughs> back up back in the news and we will cover that and uh he's had some issues with mr bob clark bob clark his name goes back before i was ever involved in the hobby he's been collecting stuff for a long time 
and breeding Burmese pythons and reticulated pythons when they were more, actually, in my opinion, more popular in the hobby and kind of helped grow the hobby, I feel. You know, you can go back, you know, decades and decades and decades. You can go back a century and there's people in circuses and carnivals and they, they got snakes. You know, there's a snake lady and a tattoo lady and Burmese pythons, when you go back and look at those antique photos, are, are usually in the ones that are depicted in them. Sometimes a bull python. But, um, yeah, um, Bob Clark has, he used to have a, a really good reputation as a big name breeder in the reptile world. And he's kept a lot of stuff. He has a lot of experience. Not everybody does things the, the, the necessarily the right way. They do it their way. He's learned a lot of things and learned from mistakes. And, you know, he's contributed um, a lot to the hobby, even though I'm not a big, like, you know, big snake person. That's just not my thing. But there are people that are into that. And and he's created some cool stuff. And he's he's got, like, piebald Burmese pythons. And he's got, like, all sorts of line bread stuff that he's done for years and years and years and stuck with i've seen videos um online and on facebook of his uh collection and his facility and and some people don't like the way that he does things people that have worked with him have come out and been at odds and um you know there's pros and cons to all of this and and having a giant mass producing collection and being a big name in the hobby and and uh usually that garners some respect you become almost like a legend over the years when you're in reptiles magazine and you're like you know but for whatever reason it's gotten to the point and i i i have not spoken with bob clark uh personally i i've never wanted to get anything from him but i'm you know aware of the stuff that he's offered and you know i've never thought weird of him um i respect people that have stuck it out in the hobby for a long time and and, th and that's cool he's done some cool stuff but he's also in his maybe older age i'm not discriminating man i'm not saying he's like losing touch with stuff but he has rubbed some people the wrong way from what i've heard and he's apparently i mean you know we don't know we weren't involved in them but it sounds like he's uh had a couple really disappointed customers in in the recent years and uh those were stories that were newsworthy in a sense in the hobby if you you know you like gossip and stuff and 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 he's tried to troubleshoot that and maybe made make some improvements with social media. He's he's big on Facebook. He used to run a lot of like like auctions and different things and and uh, sell a lot of stuff through through there, which obviously you can't now. And um, he uh, has mixed it up with Darian, and they go back and forth. You know, sometimes in life. You got to be the bigger person and, you you know, it's best to be mature and, and some people just can't let stuff go, you know, like if I could never go on Morph Market again for some reason uh, that, I mean, I wouldn't want to do anything wrong to do that, but like my life would still go on and I, I, I would, if I was still involved with breeding snakes, I would still breed snakes and still sell snakes. It wouldn't change really a whole lot. Just one of my avenues of advertising and, and and whatnot. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't prefer that. I think more market is like a great site and a great resource. But Bob is no longer able to sell on there because of his differences that have escalated with the owner. And uh, maybe he could work that out. But it's from what I can tell, man, I haven't really talked to them both about it a lot. Like, you can work stuff out man you can smash stuff you can like apologize you can like you know come to like terms of like you know um understanding and and you know uh rectify situations and and that doesn't seem to really be going on uh there's all sorts of bob clark fans i'm guessing that have created little uh accounts and like mess with uh darian just because uh that's fun for them and there's a whole 
like high school mentality back and forth, uh, like firing of bullets going by. And you, every once in a while, if you, you, you're on a, enough Facebook stuff and, and you, you like a little bit of gossip and drama, you, you'll see it. You, bullets coming by. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, you know, some people just like a car crash. And, uh, man, I, I've, I've heard the audio tape of Bob Clark addressing Darian with their initial, um, it, you know, uh, problems and trying to work it out. And, and I respect someone, you know, maybe he cussed a little bit more than he needed to, but I, I respect somebody that is going to be like, Hey, this is how I feel like you're messing with me or blah, 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 right or wrong. I, I express, I respect like communication and just putting it all out there in your feelings and, you know, trying to get somewhere with, with that because communication man that's key and they can't seem to work it out all the way <laughs> and i don't know how long this feud is going to go on for or how much how many memes are going to come from it over the years but jesus guys <laughs> you know like <clears throat> it's a little funny but it's also pretty immature so um yeah, maybe everybody can can learn from that, you know. And sometimes it's okay to just like be like, oh yeah, this is a drama. Let me uh, put a like a sarcastic like uh, comedic spin on it and check this out. You know, sometimes that's it's good to just laugh about stuff. But yeah, maybe the two of them need to have a another phone call that's calmer, and and just and just talk, man. They both have a lot of experience in this hobby. Just, just talk it out, dude. But yeah, this is going on right when he comes back from vacation. <laughs> His new Mexican tattoos haven't even healed. And here he is <laughs> back on the news. And, you know, he could have come on the show today. I sent him some last minute messages because I tried to tentatively set this up. He's interested and I would love nothing more to have him on here and, and and express some of his views and opinions and experiences with having like, uh, you know, a, a roach feeder site. And, and now he has like a, a pet store. He's the owner of Morph Market. Like there's so many stories there. There's so many interesting things to talk about. I mean, you could have like a double episode, man. And, you know, I know you don't prefer that. But, but uh, yeah, he is interested. And, and I believe him on coming on the show. Just the timing wasn't uh wasn't perfect and so last minute i tried to reach out to him today and he saw the messages he looked at them and <laughs> i put some more i put some more messages with my phone number and he didn't respond in time and again i could have got in touch with him more in recent days but i have a lot going on right now so didn't happen sorry folks thanks for all that insight into that now when i got back <laughs> into the ball pythons in 2020 i kept two ball pythons from my previous collection and one of them was an ivory male and i wanted to make more ivories or freeways or highways and i looked on wharf market mm -hmm. and there was a pastel highway and on mm -hmm. sale by bob clark and this was going to be my first morph market purchase and bob clark was a big name i saw him in yeah. Reptile magazine and everything and i said you know what? Yeah. he's going to be trustworthy so i'll buy that snake Mm -hmm. It came in this beautiful custom box, Bob Clark box that looked like a wooden box. Really cool. Mm -hmm. Beautiful snake, healthy snake, absolutely no problems. Gave me a clutch, made some ivories, made some highways. I still have her in the rack right behind me. Yeah, that, that you made a highway that you gave away. Um, yeah, it was my first giveaway. And it was beautiful. And it, it, it said, you know, um, to enter that was like comment, life is a highway, right? Yeah, because right. I, I commented and I wanted that snake and I think pastel highways are beautiful, simple, not super ultra fancy, but like amazing, just standalone uh, little combo. And um, so, OK, yeah, c continue. I'm sorry. What how, what else? What else so, was your experience with that? And she's got I, I'm breeding her to a, an orange dream and she had puzzle this year. So with testing, I could hold back all the head puzzles on that but mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful girl i love her no problems with that of course i know he had issues with um other animals that he sold 
and mm-hmm. you've covered all that so i don't need to add on mm-hmm. to that but yeah darian he's revamp morph market i'm i'm a big fan of morph market and as far his as his personal facebook i go on there like every other day and just for the ent- entertainment aspect of it and i know it totally rubs people the wrong way i was i was pissed off when he when he disballed python breeders last year but mm-hmm. you know um i got no issues with the guy morph market's great and yeah. feud with Bob, Bob Clark. Hopefully they'll work it out someday, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, hopefully. And, you know, maybe he, if he does come on the show, he won't really want to address it too much, you know? Um, or maybe he'll have new stuff to say about it. About it. But, like, uh, yeah, any which way you boil it down, um, look at it from different angles. Morph Market's a great site. Lots of people use it for lots of reptiles far better than any other site that we used to have uh, us old timers like way back in the day and uh it's improved in my opinion since he's become an owner so that's that definitely let's move on to our second topic of the day and i posted this on my instagram and i saw it got a lot of buzz on there but mm-hmm. i was watching late to the mic i believe with the owner of the NARBC and he was saying how in the future if you rent your table out to someone else and you're not there physically they're going to take that table away and give it away to someone else I know typically Tinley has been seen as a ball python reptile show mainly but they do want to make things more diverse and Honestly, I don't see a problem with making shows more diverse. I remember shows back in the in the 2000s, how diverse it was and how amazing it was. But as a budding ball python breeder and hopefully wanting to do a show myself someday, that's a little discouraging because maybe this will start going into other shows. How's Pomona going to do it? How's Anaheim going to do it? Those little shows we have here in California. Are they going to follow suit with that? So that's a little troubling for me. What are your mm-hmm. thoughts on that? Well, for whatever reason, even though this info has been out for a little bit, I, I didn't really notice it. I, I, I People get their spots. They wait in line. They put in the money, the time, and the effort to be vendors at shows. And sometimes they can't commit to their spot. Sometimes life happens things happen and they you know let somebody else use it because it's their spot that they've they've earned through like loyalty and time by continuing to be a part of it and you know if that's going to be something that's affected like um yeah i mean some some renters won't let you sublease you know some people find out that somebody else has moved into an apartment or a house and they're uh that wasn't their original agreement and they're not happy with that. Some people are cool with it. So I think some shows will be cool with it still. And some, some shows will not. And, um, I could get where some people feel like, well, we're on this waiting list and we have to wait forever. And these people are just going to never give up their spot, even though they don't stick to it and commit to it because something came up for, you know, well, that's the way it goes sometimes. And that that spot should then free up to somebody waiting. You know, does that make sense? That's like pretty logical. And um, I I can't really disagree with that mindset and with with that that formula for being fair. Um, so we'll we'll just we'll just have to we'll just have to see uh, over over time. I mean, it's it's up to the you know promoters of shows the the people that run them it's it's you know it's really it's really up to them and you know if you're you're going to be a vendor and you want to hold on to that spot then you should probably fulfill your commitment to that show like narbc shows there's not a ton of them throughout the year for people that really are into vending they should want to be at that show and they should make it work they should have plenty of time to plan for that show, you know, um, so we'll see, everybody will have their own take on it. I'm kind of just 
thinking about it right right now, processing. Let's address this comment here from Aaron. It says, how many people yeah. that have been waiting on the list are seeing the newer breeders there and getting upset with Bob and Brian? Now, our boy Adam, he managed to squeeze his way into Tinley and has vended the past two years. Mm -hmm. Now, are there other breeders that were there waiting on that list and saw Adam get ahead of them and got mm -hmm. upset about that? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, look. <laughs> in life and in business and especially like in politics and that crappy stuff like sometimes there's angles to take sometimes people are smart sometimes people get lucky sometimes people have something fall in their lap sometimes things just work out for people you know whether they deserved it or not like uh, like yeah if you can find an angle to get in a show as, as that's what this is pertaining to. And you can get in the door and you can vend. And it's just like people sharing their table with someone else. They can't really get get in and take all the steps. And they, so they share a little spot on their table with their, their friend and they essentially sublease. Like, I don't have a problem with that. That goes on a lot. And that gives people like a little boost and a head start into like doing their own thing. And, um, but I can see where if people are on a waiting list, and they've waited, <laughs> you know, like what's fair is fair, right? You know, but life isn't always fair. And, you know, this is a private promotion and shows and they can kind of make the rules how they want, really. Um, but I, I have no problem with people like Adam having, you know, slipped in there. You know, you make good relationships and somebody has like an angle where they can help you out. And you're doing things to help them out and you're 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 like uh you know networking and, and you find find a way in good for you as far as i'm concerned um i don't i don't have a problem with that but i could understand where some people will feel will feel slighted you know get on that wait list and you might have to wait and you know when you do get your spot at whatever show that is that you patiently waited for hold on to it don't rent it out to somebody else take that opportunity and run with it you know and and commit to it and you won't have any problems and um, if you're having a hard time getting into shows and you're ready to make that investment and, and that commitment like uh just be patient and just keep trying just keep trying hey is there any cancellations hey is there any opportunity hey how far down on this list am i <laughs> <laughs> and you know and just keep trying um that would be um my best advice one more thing that kind of ties with this i notice a lot of ball python breeders are starting to diversify a little bit and i don't know if that has to do with just having more on the table at reptile shows but i know mj he's been always advocating getting into other reptiles we both have multiple species I'm big into turtles. I'd love to have turtles on the table, but unfortunately those, that's not, fe turtles aren't really feasible to breed. It takes them 10 years to be breedable and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But do you think that's the way to go to diversify? Maybe get some other species on the table in order yeah, to- Yeah, I mean, back in the day, I never went to a Daytona sh show in Florida. And I know they started in Orlando, but that was, pretty much pre my involvement in the hobby, pretty much. Daytona back in the day, even though I never went, I'd hear the stories of it and see the pictures of it. And it was like the place to be. And part of the reason it was the place to be wasn't because it was just chock full of ball pythons. It was chock full of all sorts of variety. Did you want to bring him to me? You, you good? And like, Man, back in the day, I used to go to any reptile show, small. I've been to plenty of bigger ones. And what's so fun is like, you know, like, do you want to go to the zoo and see a, a hundred rhinoceroses and maybe one penguin? No, like you want variety. You go there to learn and see different stuff. And, and people go to reptile shows and they want to see different stuff and they, they want to learn. Some people are just like, you could call them looky loos or whatever, but they're just, they're just being entertained like a petting zoo. They're just entering the world of, of reptiles and seeing what it offers and 
And, uh, and that's part of this whole industry too. What's part of accepting, bringing people into it and sharing knowledge. And you might spark interest in somebody else with wildlife on the planet. And, um, yeah, I, I, I feel like keepers of reptiles will learn more and get a greater sense of appreciation and, and, and a, more fascinations if they start working with different stuff. Some people get the entry level pets like we had on the list earlier, and then they, they graduate to different things. They learn how to take care of that easier animal correctly. And then they work with something else. I mean, I dove right in. I started with like my first reptile was an, an iguana because I saw one that was big and so cool and chill in Los Angeles when I was a teenager. And I was like, wow, one day I'm gonna have one of those. And I did get one, and then I got a leopard gecko. She she lived a very long time, and um, I got one of everything. <laughs> I have an addictive personality, and I like to learn. And um, you will learn if you put in the effort and um, in this hobby, and you know you'll you'll have a better sense of the cycle of life. You'll you'll learn a greater uh, respect for different creatures that share this planet with us. And you, you'll, you'll most likely um, have a lot of fun with it. You know, everybody's, you know, for the most part, has cats and dogs. They're all through, through America. America loves cats and dogs. And it took a long time for them to be domesticated. And, you know, you look back in the, the hieroglyphs and you'll see, you know, the Egyptians had cats and stuff. And, you know, the, the reptiles have gained in interest and have been kept more in in uh, capt captivity across the different continents on our planet than ever before people are having fun with it there's a lot to still learn from it and um yeah i say branch out and if you feel overwhelmed find a good spot for that home that that for that animal that you you got involved with you know you not everybody can be successful with everything and then maybe try something different you know turtles in a sense aquatic or or land like uh or in, in my opinion some people think they're easy like in the 70s 60s and 70s people would keep like uh you know reddered sliders and different things and that's where the whole like salmonella thing came up and kids shouldn't have turtles and there's rules on the west coast can't have under like four inch shell or whatever like you know, turtles are a little bit more advanced and they will, like parrots, a lot of the species of them will will uh, live for a very long time and maybe outlive you. And it's a, it's a big commitment to make and you need to take that from a, a place of um, responsibility. And, um, but there are all sorts of animals that you can step up to and it doesn't have to be the most advanced ones. And, and just work on it and, and learn. Yeah. Okay, let's get on to our final subject here. If you watched Justin's latest video this morning, when I saw the, the headline on that, I was like, oh, cool, there's a new gene here. Mm -hmm. And I was tricked. It's not a new gene. It's just <laughs> the naming of an existing gene, kind of like how we talked about in the previous show about the nanny. So the mace. And I got a picture of mace window here because that's the, the first person that came to mind when I heard the name of it. I think the name is, is really cool and it does pay tribute to Tim Masek, who was the one who came up with this gene. But let's talk a little bit about the extremist gene. Uh, I'll talk here and then I'll hopefully you could clear up some of the stuff because it's a little fuzzy for me. But the extremist yeah. gene from the extreme gene, um, which I know had ties with the tristripe as well kind of like how pides they used to think that leopards were het pides because it was closely tied with the pied and i think mm -hmm. extreme gene was also tied with a tristripe and somehow the extremists came out of that and it was introduced on justin's video today and some beautiful examples on there i tell you what whenever justin yeah. puts something new out there you look on morph market to see how many how much they are I tell you what, I looked on Morph Market and those mace jeans, they're crazy price. I don't think the extremists were going for that much before. <laughs> yeah. Rebranding. <laughs> so, 
So what are your thoughts on this? The mace? Um, I don't know Ken Masick very well other than um, he has a pretty good reputation and he's been in the hobby a long time. I have talked to him ever so briefly when I was interested in a couple snakes that he had posted on Morph Market, so I contacted him. But it didn't really talk in much length, and I didn't talk to him about this gene. But I watched a video that he made last year that tried to, like, free up some of the confusion around it. I mean, you, when you get a new gene in your collection that pops out, it sometimes takes years and years and years and generations to like really figure out, I mean, usually it does, what's going on. Is there a super? How is this acting? All oh, these are there's these other genes tied in. So like what's really happening? And I don't know a ton about it. Um to break it all down. Um from research and and from knowledge but I don't, I don't have that gene in my collection knowingly and uh it seems to do some really cool things in the video that ken had posted showing how it's clear that he has this new gene it was doing some wild stuff unusual and unique stuff like like nothing else and i was like wow that's really interesting the name and the marketing of it didn't fit really in in my my opinion to to gain a lot of traction and i know he has sold some stuff to different people and then some of those people have made stuff and posted it for sale but it's a pretty confusing like uh pitch it seems like in my opinion um and time will tell M more has to be done with it to really see the full potential but when you have finally someone like you know Brittany gobble and justin kabilka working with it and putting it on youtube man that's all you needed like i i hope i hope they got i know they bought snakes from him and, and have have a relationship with him I, I hope they got some free stuff from him <laughs> for posting this video because that's the kind of influence that they have um in the ball python area of the hobby to really blow stuff up and man the snakes that they showed today somewhat simple but show a ton of potential and color and everybody will be talking about it now and i think some really neat things will come out um over time as people acquire it and work with it but um a clear cut you know hey it's this and this and that like i, I renaming it mace pretty smart um 3500 for an extremist now yeah um apparently we just had an inflation boom in our country aaron because <laughs> i hope the gas isn't 25 dollars a gallon when i go fill up tomorrow but yeah you know sometimes stuff will be available people will have this unique little gene and maybe it's got a lot of potential or maybe it's, it is what it is and it is a new thing, but it doesn't really do a whole lot. And the, it's, it's affordable. And then it's sort of not like, um, uh, the guy with the incubators, Mike Wilbanks, he has a gene called orange crush, you know, mm -hmm. like the soda. And I remember first coming on morph market and seeing, that gene and being like oh I, I like unusual stuff i want to work with something that not everyone's working with um orange dream doesn't always impress me now we got like high od and all these other things but like i thought like oh is it it's like a maybe a recessive orange dream in a sense like that seems pretty cool and i was tempted to get a couple snakes from from his postings on morph market and i chose not to and then he decided that it has even more potential than than he thinks anyways and he took them all off somewhere he had posted that he was gonna do that and said yeah no i'm gonna sell them for more later like uh, uh people don't want to believe in this this gene and take a chance on it fine i mean he pumps out thousands and thousands of snakes <laughs> every year he's just gonna you know work with it and see what it can do and that's really what you should do with a gene before you release it anyways 
but um, yeah, now he wants, I don't know how much, but definitely an inflated amount more for Orange Crush, and that, that's fine, whatever, like, I'm probably not going to get that, and I'm not, like, super, like, uh, I'm intrigued, but I'm not super, like, likely to get involved with the mace gene but i think that they're going about marketing correctly now and i think it's going to do some cool stuff i do for sure and um i have that to say on it <laughs> yeah with the that letter x there's what gene x extreme extremists so mm -hmm. creating this new name mace I, I think is a good thing but will the community accept it if you read britney's advertisement on morph market it's it's a little confusing because it mentions extremists and maze parentheses maze stuff like that so um, yeah the way the way the gene works it seems like a tiny bit complicated with the hats and things and at one point my mind was like a bit wrapped around it but it's just not like top priority to me i i i, I think it's gonna do cool stuff and everything will be clear just like desert ghost had a whole bunch of complications all of a sudden and man it's it's still just recessive it's still going to be cool it's still going to do cool things and you know things aren't always as complicated as as they're made out to be but uh the way that the gene had been marketed was pretty complicated in people's explanations of it in their sales pitches and that's what's made it be a little bit slower for people to you know gravitate towards and be interested in and want to work with but renaming it was smart like i said and you know you know justin making a video of it is pretty much in my opinion even though he would tell you that this is not the case the gene has just been renamed <laughs> with coordination of the person that uh you know started it and with justin kabilka that is uh that's that yeah so mace gene and that will become clearer uh as, as time time goes on there's a super and they look super and um you know n not not like oh i gotta have that now for me but um I, it's going to draw a lot of attention and, and, um, from the animals I've seen Ken Masick show that like, pff, there's a ton of potential Mark, the things that it does on the sides of the snakes, like is like wild, like it, like leopard and yellow belly doing crazy stuff. Like it does its own crazy wild pattern, pattern changing stuff. And it, it seems to brighten the animals a little bit and um it's just unusual it's definitely its own thing and different and and it's gonna be fun um in my opinion from what i can tell yeah yeah another gene for us to mess around with again like you said with with justin putting this video out here it's now the mace there ain't gonna be no controversy about it yeah yeah i mean and it's a cool name too mace is like a and like a middle aged like weapon, right? Like a mace is like you don't want to die that way. <laughs> so pretty badass name in my opinion. Um, and it's cool yeah. how it honors Ken Masek's name, right? Mace. Masek. Right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it takes a while to get it right, you know. And they did, and it's going to be super helpful. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that some genes don't fade away because there's been plenty of genes and di di different kinds of reptiles that have just been lost forever. Like, I think like chocolate king snakes, all right, there aren't very many of them anymore that are true chocolate and not just happen to be variances of locales. And like ultramel in corn snakes, some people don't even know there's an ultramel, pretty difficult to find. Like some genes, and they could be just ever so subtle pattern changers or color changers just get lost in the shuffle over the years and you know only certain people work with them and then they're gone you know same thing with species like certain species of reptiles that have come into our country over the years like don't aren't allowed back in and um essentially bottleneck genetics and, and it's like basically lost like bearded dragons such a, a popular 
reptile. They're essentially the parrot of the reptile world. And there's seven different species of bearded dragons. People don't usually think much on that. One of the other species of them is a Rankin's dragon. And Rankin's dragon is like a dwarf bearded dragon. Just like a dwarf, you know, like an Aki would be like a, a dwarf, you know, Goana. It's like they're really cool, more manageable. But Rankin's dragons didn't come into America in the numbers that, you know, the other Pagona did. And they are not healthy. You're pretty much assured to not be very successful breeding them. Now, I'd like to think one day we can work something out with Australia. <laughs> like, yes. come on now. Like, we'll we'll send stuff from our zoos to your zoos. Let's work stuff out. Hey, can we buy some some of the? Can, you're gonna, you know, we'll buy this from you. Can you send over some reptiles too? Like, and maybe politicians just aren't, you know, as big of reptile collectors. But I think I could convince Australia to share if I was in a better position of like being able to talk to who's who like you know and zoos talk to each other and sometimes they do make exceptions and zoos around the world work with each other and share stuff some sometimes but um yeah like i guess ultimately mark what i'm saying is is a lot of genes are are lost um i, I have the jedi gene which i got from Brittany gobble mm -hmm. the first male that i bought was a mojave jedi and, and I like them. It's a very subtle gene mutation. It does have a super. It's, I think, pretty cool. Hasn't been worked with much. Uh, right before last week, like right after we had our last show, I, I contacted uh, the originator of the, the gene, uh, John Barry. And he, he, I think sometimes is like in the UK. Maybe he used to live there, but now like... I I think he's in Texas. I spoke with him. I reached out and he didn't, he didn't like get back to me for, for weeks. And then finally saw the Instagram message. He mostly works with Hognose now. And he has some cool stuff and he's having fun with it. And the, the Jedi gene popped out in his collection. And I think he called the super, uh, um, Panther, super Panther. And, and I, you know, had talked to him a little bit about, Hey, I want to get the story in the Jedi gene. I believe in it, even though it's subtle, it does some, some neat little things. And I, I think it, it could, it's just the route that I took. I want to play with this. And, and he just said, basically, no, I don't have ball pythons anymore. And, and really hasn't gotten back to me much more than that. <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine. He's having fun. And, and I don't think he's like as big on social media. Maybe I'll get him to open up a little bit more later, but um, I tried. And um, but some of these genes are are lost in the ball python world and um, never come back. You know, like Brian Barcheck has imported lots of snakes. You know, he brought in the sunset snake, brought it and and you know seventy thousand dollars from from uh, from for importing it, and that's a pretty cool story. That's one of the reasons why I like Sunset so much because it's so different and such a neat story. And, um, you know, but he's imported other things as other big name breeders uh, have as well. And some of those genes don't prove out. And some of those genes are capable of proving out. But it never really comes to fruition for, you know, something's not healthy enough. It just doesn't feel like breeding. And, and you know, it's, it's good to see new genes pop up. It's crazy the uh, amount of flavors there are at this ball python ice cream shop. But more things are going to happen. And, and it'll be cool if people keep them alive. So that's what's going on with this new gene that has been renamed Mace. And, um... It's going to do some cool stuff, Mark. I look forward to see what Justin does with it. Just one final yeah, point right? on your <laughs> Australia thing. One of my mm -hmm. dream species is the shingleback. So, and mm -hmm. they have crazy morphs in, in Australia, but we can't have they them do. over here. So, maybe someday. Yeah. They have back. like melanistic skinks. Yeah. They have like uh, just all sorts of crazy stuff. And it's like, grr. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jason, I'm going to call it here. We get 
Another right. great show. Thank you to our audience that showed up for it. Really yes, appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for showing up and being supportive. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great week, everybody. See you later. <laughs>